Kia ora tato. It's five o'clock and you're tuned to Otago Access Radio. Great to have your company for episode four of Rattling the Chains. I'm your host, Ian Telfer, and tonight in the hot seat, we have three people who want to be mayor, and they are. To my left, a four-term city councillor, well-known as a debt hawk and certainly not afraid to speak his mind, Lee Vandervis. Kia ora, Lee. Nice to meet you. Thanks for the opportunity. A one-term city councillor, but before that, uh, Otago Peninsula champion and a businesswoman, among other things, Christine Gary. Welcome, Christine. Kia ora, Ian. And in the middle, a taxi driver, former army major, and a Red Cross relief coordinator around the globe, including some of the uh, some tricky places, South Sudan, Haiti, and Philippines, I saw, Bob Barlin. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Ian. Mm. Well, uh, two or three of you, uh, the billboards are up and the election is in full swing, I think, now. And uh, the candidate meetings are beginning and the profiles are going out. So so can we start with election news? Um, the first thing I saw this week was Carlin, Carmen Houlihan um, having a terrible time with her billboards. It seems like some people are cutting the cutting her head out of them and the transport agency even stole a couple. Um, is anyone else having any trouble with billboards? So no, I'm not, but I'm very aware that there are some places that are more vandalism prone than others. So I've managed my billboards accordingly. I have most of mine on oh. private property because they get less vandalised. Do you think she was unlucky or do you think, think that's what unlucky. happens when you put them out in public? I think she was unlucky. Mm. Anyone else? Um, she was unlucky, certainly, but also paid a price for going out first. I haven't put right. any of mine out yet. I'm not going to for a while. Uh, wait till the vandals get a bit tired. Uh, That's interesting. Have you experienced it before that made yes. you think that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Going out there first um, is basically... You're just fair game. Well, it's asking for more trouble. Asking really. for trouble. Yeah. But if you hold back, does it... Do you don't get as much bang for your buck? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think what happens is you end up with this little forest of stuff everywhere and people get tired of it. And then if you come in with something that actually got some content, especially if it's got some size, uh, that works really well. It, it, it allowed me to get almost double the vote of every other councillor at the last election. Do they still do the business, these old-fashioned you know, photo boards? No, I don't, I don't think so, um, Ian. Christine? No. Um, I think it's got to be a, a multifaceted campaign. It's only one part of it, and certainly it is a part of it, but there are so many other... Um, things that you need to be doing uh, to engage with the community about elections. But they are sprouting everywhere now, aren't they? People's front yards, backyards. Bob, are you in this game too? Have you got pictures of yourself? My first one went up this afternoon and I've got a few more ready to go up tomorrow. Mm. But So people like to see the face or, or, or why do people still do it? The face is really important because people like to be able to put a, a face to the name. So that is that recognising the face is important. Okay, so even in the 21st century? In the 21st century especially, um, I didn't do any ODT ads in the last election. I, I leaned very heavily on the poster campaign. That gave me the name recognition that was largely responsible, I think, for it. Plus, I don't just put vote for Lee. I actually put what I want to do, the main issues, the main right. four of them on the, on the poster. So it's a summary of your whole campaign yeah. right there? Yeah. Mm, interesting. All right. Um, the other campaign news this week is a bit trickier. It's a bit more sensitive. Um, Lee, you hit the front page of the ODT, well, probably not by your choice, but um, about there being a dozen complaints lodged against you. And it wasn't a very good look. What What's going on there? Well, it's the same complaints uh, article that uh, Mayor Cull put on the front page over a month ago. Uh, it was followed up with the same complaints article by Benson Pope two weeks later. Uh, claiming that I'd written these abusive and harassing emails. Um, in both cases, the first thing I did, the only thing I could do was release all possible emails uh, to anyone that wanted to uh, send in their um, email address to me. I'll still do that. And everybody that actually read the emails didn't find anything harassing or abusive in them. It's nothing but a rather gross smear campaign. You think, do you really think the whole, the whole thing's politically motivated? Well, how else could it be motivated, do you think? Mm. Given the timing, given that someone's been collecting complaints over the last six years, I think it is. Uh, it wasn't just a question of the, the council releasing them by a dogged reporter? Oh, the, a dog, the dogged reporter's been on my case for a very long time and I refuse to speak to him and, and that just makes him even more dogged. Mm. Um, I refuse to speak to him because he, re, he simply won't quote me correctly and misrepresents me on a regular basis. I, I have seen 
some of your emails in the past, though, and mm. you're pretty you're pretty direct, aren't you, at times? Oh, absolutely. You, That's what I'm paid for. Uh, you know, like uh, in terms of complaints, there have been 11 complaints apparently by staff against me. You'll realise that most of those complaints weren't actually by staff at all. They're by councillors, competing councillors, who didn't like the tone of my emails because I let other councillors see them as well. Mm. Uh, so, But if you consider that I would have made at least 100 complaints of staff not doing their job, not giving us appropriate information, not giving us uh, uh, timely responses to Lagoima requests over that period. Um, I've made 100 complaints of them. I've been an incredibly active uh, counsellor. Um, getting 11 complaints back in that context is actually probably not such a big deal. There's you- been no evidence produced of any of these complaints. I've asked to see the complaints and the chief executive won't show them to me. Do you think you've ever crossed the line, Lee? Like you, oh, I cross you, it all the like line. You, I cross it all the but time. But I mean, I mean, you know, into, into abusive of staff or into, no, you know, in situations which you, look, you should have known better. I'm always respectful of staff, but if they are ignorant, for instance, of standing orders and giving correct advice, then I'm going to put in an email that they are ignorant of one particular standing order and please sort it out for next time. And if they don't like that, if they find that upsetting, well, I'm sorry, but what would you rather have me do? Not make the complaint in the first place? I mean, that's what everyone else does. They just they just let it all swan by. I don't. I resist all incompetence. I don't uh, have any problem taking staff to task about not doing their job properly. And as far as the idea about uh, attacking women, All of our staff in the governance team, all of the staff that look after information requests, they're all women anyway. The chief executive is a woman, the head of HR is a woman, uh, the head of governance is a woman. I've got no choice but to make those complaints of women. So you don't see it as as gendered, it would just be whoever's in those roles? I mean, there's gross gender imbalance in the council and that it's always women that we deal with. So I've got absolutely no choice. Mm. Chris, can I ask you, I mean, you've been in this council. (laughs) Are you concerned by what you see or what do you say? First of all, um, praise in public criticise in private is the first mantra that I have. The second is that nobody should go to work and um, be subject to bullying and be subject to uh, abuse. And so those complaints are not all about, I would suggest to you, emails. Um, Complaints are made by staff and there is a process and of course the details of them are not going to be released for the privacy of the individuals. So there's another whole side to the story. There isn't a whole side to this story. I am very careful to make sure that all my complaints of staff are always in a recorded email, they're always in email so that I have a record. This idea that somehow the emails uh, which which Councillor Wilson said were vitriolic, which the Mayor said were abusive, which Benson Pope said were harassing, all those emails have proven to be nothing of the sort. So they've broadened it a bit to say, oh no, he's already he's okay, he's also said certain names things. Well, quite frankly, uh, that's not been the case. The emails are what I learned very early to stick with mm. in council because that's when you have a record. Is this going to work for you though, Lee, or is it because if you come in as, as mayor, yes, are you going to be able to have the the right kind of relationship with a positive relationship, like, or is this going to be a bit of a millstone? Um, All this history that you've got, you know, it's become quite it, a lot of baggage now. It, it's, it? it's the opposite of a millstone. If people know, if staff know that they're going to be uh, looked at in terms of getting things right and that they're going to be hauled up if they don't get things right, then there's a much better chance of them getting things right. So in the end you feel it's public accountability but, f- but fair? I make no apology for bringing staff to be accountable and there have been a lot of situations in which, quite frankly, things haven't been done correctly. I mean, right down to the uh, incorrect recording of minutes where they claimed I voted for something that I voted against or vice versa. Uh, I haul everyone up on those things and it's what I intend to do as Mayor as well. I intend getting a better standard of response from our staff. Goodness knows we've got enough of them. Goodness knows they're well paid as well. A lot of them are on six figures. They need to accept that if they don't uh, actually perform as per their job descriptions, if they don't know what standing orders are, then I'm going to haul them up on it. As mere it's a tough stance, isn't it? So Ian, um, my belief is that we have uh, a, a very 
uh, solid staff who give good advice and are there for their professional expertise. Um, and we are well, very well served. You don't buy this, we need to slap I, them into line? A- absolutely not. Um, and I can say that when I started into this, often people come into local government through an issue, and that's how I came into local government, community board. And I was a grumpy, I'm, I'm very happy to acknowledge I was a grumpy elected member for the first three years. And I would call staff out in the media. But I learnt very quickly that that is not the best way to get the best out of people. Um, the, be- the way to get the best out of people is to work with them. And of course sometimes mistakes are made, but those are very few beh- and far between uh, in my experience. Um, that does not stop elected members from making, uh, asking searching questions, that's our job. But it is possible um, to ask that without being disagreeable and abusive, that is possible. Bob, I've left you out, sorry. We're sitting in the middle there, with, with, uh, but is there anything you want to say about this? As, as I mean, obviously you've been off, not on the council. Have you been into Watch Council and, and how do you see it? Yes, I've been into Watch Council and the morning I went in it was the Housing Council meeting and I thought it went very well actually. Hmm. Hmm. Have you been concerned looking in on how the council's been operating or do you think it's in fact been quite a good robust kind of place? I think it's sad. I think uh, somewhere along the line something isn't working but um, I don't know, when I've worked overseas and wherever you've had to get to know people very quickly. When you're in a disaster, it's quite a leveller to meet lots and lots of people who don't speak your language and get on with them and form them into a team. Um, And then you've really got to work together for a common good. And so I've had to do that many, many times. And uh, if I come into the council, then that's what we're going to do. But I think it's important that Everybody is treated with respect. Everybody is worthy of respect. Everybody wants to have dignity. And that's how they should be treated. If people have got issues, then they should be discussed in private and not aired in public. Although, you know, looking around the world, it seems to be more common than not to discuss issues in public for other people's gratification. I think. You just keep things quiet behind the scenes and get on with the job of um, working together. I agree with that entirely and in fact all my complaints have been in private. It's only my accusers that have actually dragged them out into public to try and use them to blacken my name. Uh, There's a lot of uh, um, stuff that has been going on in council that shouldn't have been going on for a very long time. I don't have to mention the city fleet frauds. I don't have to mention the fact that uh, the DCC were paying contractors to clean mud tanks that never got cleaned for years. I don't have to mention the fact that the city council uh, didn't look at what its council companies were doing and they've lost tens of millions of dollars in absolutely very questionable subdivisions and all sorts of other stuff like that. All of these issues I've dealt with in non-public. The only reason they've become public is because the Mayor, Benson Pope and Councillor Wilson have decided to make a bit of an election issue out of it. In the end, Lee, do you think you would be the kind of Mayor that you've been as a councillor or do you think you would carve out a new direction? Oh no, as Mayor you've got a totally different job. As a councillor you basically have to stay up late at night thinking of provocative ways of saying things just to get cut through to get some of these issues raised in the media. And with a monopoly media in town, it's very hard. For instance, trying to get this debt graph printed in the ODT has proven to be impossible. That there, I have seen it online. but yeah. You've seen it online mm. uh, only because the ODT wouldn't print it. I sent right. it to the ODT first. That there, the top of that debt graph is $1,000 million. And how many people in the need actually know that? I tried to get it into the annual plan. The DCC refused to print it. The ODT refused to print it. So I go public with this sort of stuff very definitely. Mm. But I don't criticise any staff doing it. I stick to the issues. And that is our major issue. All right. Well, let's come back to that one. But let's let's move on to a little who are you quiz and at least get some biographical information out on the table. Um, I've got three minutes on my very expensive timer and um, and I'll just get you to answer as quickly as you can through these and then we'll come back to some of the big issues facing the campaign. So here we go. Uh, your full name. How about you start, Chris? Christine Peter Gary. Mm. 
Robert Philip Barlin. Lee Vandivis. Have you got no middle name? No, oh. they, sh- they shortchanged me. My brother's got them. I didn't for some I reason. I didn't know that. <laughs> right, uh, the suburb you live in? I live in Broad Bay on the Attack of Peninsula. Ravensbourne. Roslyn. Right. The type of transport you use to get here today? Car. Car. Electric, all battery leaf. Oh. Electric Charged car. on solar power from our farm. I didn't know that. All right. Um, how many kids or grandkids you've got? I have one daughter. Mm. Uh, none. Mm. I've got a goddaughter, but no children. Five kids, two grandkids. Oh, you win the family award. All right, fine. Um, Favourite childhood memory? A morak here on a beautiful summer's day out on the water. My parents used to take my sister and myself out every weekend to a different beach or a different park, and we'd have a picnic. Nice. Getting my driver's licence the day I turned 15 and buying my first car. Nice. All right. Um, The best song ever written. Chris. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Your favourite song. A favourite song. A favourite song. um, The the Wind Beneath My Wings. Oh. Bette Midler. Bette Midler. Nice. Lee. All You Need Is Love. Ah, Beatles. Hmm. Yeah, it's difficult for me because I like so many of them. I suppose my favourite would be one I used to sing for myself, uh, Donald Wears Your Trousers. <laughs> Catchy. <laughs> um, all right, Hos- historical figure that you would most like to meet. Do you want to start, Lee? Oh, is this an alive figure or Could a be dead either. one? Could be either. Oh, Lee Kuan Yew, the guy who turned Singapore from an island with a few rubber plantations oh. into the fabulous place it is now. Love to meet him. All right, Lee. All right. Lee, and a namesake too. Bob? Yes. What if you've already met them? Oh, tell me. Uh, the Queen. Oh. Michelle Obama. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. All right, here's a bit more particular one. Would you rather be stuck in a lift with Donald Trump or Boris Johnson or Vladimir Putin? And why? Anyone? I'll go Vladimir, uh, mainly because we know a lot about Trump and Boris already. Uh, and you could ask him about Vladimir Trump. is a bit more of an enigma. Duck horse. I understand he used to be a KGB agent as a 20-year-old playing guitar in Los Angeles undercover. I'd love to talk to him about what he thought, what he really thought of America as opposed to what gets dished nice, up. Nice, nice. All right, just a couple of seconds left, Bob. It doesn't worry me, actually, either one. I'll just take it as it comes and uh, be polite to all of them. Yeah. Trump, I have an American husband, an American daughter, and uh, we just uh, cannot believe what is happening in the United States. We're very sad about it. I would have a very interesting conversation. You have a few words to say. I would, indeed. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Bob, it seems like we've had a few allusions to this. You've had a pretty interesting life, um, and, and I don't think people probably know so much about you. So do you want to just tell us, you know, briefly, kind of how did you... How did you get here? Well, where do you want me to start? It was a very traumatic birth, but uh, I won't get into that. Mm. But I joined the army when I was 18 as a soldier and then went up through the ranks to finish as major. Did a couple of active service postings to Beirut and Damascus and Egypt. And, um, yeah, left the army and went to Hong Kong and then got rung up by the High Commission for Refugees and asked to go to Iran and run their logistics program when three million Kurdish refugees crossed the border. And then from there, the Red Cross saw me in acting and um, asked me to go and work for them for a while. So I've worked in a number of countries, Turkey, Afghanistan, former Yugoslavia, Republic of Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Um, Yeah, Geneva. And then I went to uh, Kosovo for a while with uh, Care International and then came back to New Zealand in 2002. Um, I started up a business in the Republic of Georgia, (laughs) had a second office in Kosovo, and then uh, came back to New Zealand in 2002. The army heard I was back in town and asked me if I'd rejoin 
because they were short of people. They must have been very short, actually. Um, so I joined and went around with them for a while, including East Timor, where I was lucky enough to convince the New Zealand ambassador to Timor or commissioner that uh, a school there needed a roof on its uh, building so the children could actually go to class when it was raining. And uh, then I went to Haiti for a year and a half and South Sudan. And did they all just sort of lead to each other? Did you plan any of that or did it all just... It's all just happened. It's almost like whenever a door closed, another one opened straight away. It's, it's been unbelievable. And uh, I suppose in a way I've been very lucky, but it's also been fairly demanding. It's not the sort of thing you can do when you're married, running around the world doing that sort of thing. So no. I only got married a year not and Not so half good on ago. family life, that's true. Mm. Tell me though, you go through all of that, what on earth brings you here to be want to be mayor? Relaxation. I like the place. I mean, believe it or not, I love waking up in the morning and looking across the harbour. It's a great leveller. And the other thing is is that in Dunedin, your most, uh, the best resource I've seen is the people. Because wherever you go, there's a happy smile and a wave or a hello, how are you, regardless of who you are, they do it. And when I'm driving tourists in my little taxi around town, they remark on that, they remark on um, the different types of architecture and how lovely it is to see a place that isn't looking all modern and rubbishy like everywhere else in the world is. But why, but why stand um, for public office? You've done all that. You don't need to do anything else. Like, what, what is it? What's driving you now? Let's just say that uh, I don't like the way we're increasing our debt levels and I don't like the rates going up by 60% over 10 years when you accumulate it. And um, I think there's probably a need to have a good look at what infrastructure needs to be done and have a plan of action that actually is phased so that everybody in the city knows what's going to happen. I mean, there seems to me to be a lot of secrecy about what's going to happen. Driving a cab, and I'm sure a lot of people get upset with going around a corner that you drove around yesterday and all of a sudden there's thousands of orange cones in front of you and you can't go anywhere. Um, And then you've got to turn around to the person in your cab and say, oh, sorry, I didn't know this was here. And you've got to take them another way. And then, of course, I deduct the price because it's not fair on them to be caught out. So you you felt moved to get involved, did you, at that point? I did, yes. I mean, I know cabbies are very political. You get in the cab and they always want to talk about politics, right? But And they also, they know a lot, don't they, cabbies? They know, they hear a lot. But, but I think hearing a lot. What makes you want to go the other side and, and be criticised and be in the media and all the things that happen when you're in public office? I've got to be mad. I must be mad as a hatter. Mm. That's all I can say. But I you mean, feel strongly about, you feel strongly enough about the, the debt issues or the, 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 the rates issues. I feel strongly killing. about the debt issues, but I also see another issue coming up, which is the climate change possibilities. Now, I don't know whether climate change is climate change or not, but what I do know is, is that if you look at the world as being a balloon and you've got a lot of people who just keep on breeding and getting more and more people and more and more cows and more and more this and burning this and that, there's only one direction a balloon can go and it explodes. Um, Too much it growth. explode, it implodes on itself. Right. You know, you, you just can't keep filling up a balloon with hot air. Eventually it just keeps coming back down on you. Um, and so the whole spectre of having to work together as a council to come up with a plan of action for climate change or a disaster, because it's the same thing. Um, I'd love doing that. It's a challenge. I'd really like to get Mm. into it and do something, because it involves a lot of things other than South Dunedin flooding, okay? That's only one thing. You've got all the coast from north of Waikoiti involving Omaru down past uh, Brighton, you've got the railway lines, you've got the roads, you've got Mosgiel, you've got the airport, because the airport is, roughly speaking, the lowest point New Zealand's landmass. Within a kilometre south of there, as I tell all my passengers, it's between one and three metres below sea level. Um, 
So there's an awful lot of challenges in this, and it can't be taken in isolation, each one. Everything's got to be done as an overall thing. And you're ready to get stuck in. Well, I'd like to help, put it that way. Christine, are those the big issues? What are the big issues this campaign? So there's a number of them. The first one is we need to strengthen our communities because communities do so much better when they're connected for people's well-being and in the face of emergencies and natural disasters. Uh, we need to manage the growth because we do have growing pains. So this is the first amount of growth. We've gone from a low growth city to a medium growth city in a very short amount of time. Mm. And it's the biggest growth uh, apart from a couple of blips after the World War. So this is a pretty incredible uh, factor. Um, so we've got to manage that growth and we do have growing pains. Um, the housing issues are big, uh, the housing stock, the quality of the housing stock, availability and affordability, those are really important for the well-being of our, our people. And transport issues, we don't have control over the buses, but the bus system and fixing that uh, is really in key to us getting a, an integrated a transport system. It's, it's the point for that. Is the council already, it seems like there's some plans for most of those things at least. Is it's, the council on the right track with all of that? Absolutely, and it's one thing I'm very proud of, being part of this training because we have made extraordinary progress. Let me just give you an example. Last week we made a decision uh, around uh, a navigator position. Now, I've had a long-held view that one of the um, obstacles to us releasing land in our community um, is around how difficult it is to subdivide, particularly for mom and pop subdividers, uh, people who, developers who are, maybe have a wee bit of a section, one mm-hmm. section to subdivide off. Um, and for, for the developers who are full-time at it, they've made this comment that it's difficult to navigate the pathway through council. So we have just uh, made a decision to appoint someone into that role in the next two weeks that'll be advertised and I'm delighted about to that. To do what? To to help people navigate council processes. What does that mean? Does that mean to because take them through and explain how it works? To take them through it, yeah. Um, to take them through it, to walk them through it because when you're doing a subdivision it's very complex matter. Right. And so that's just one small example. Will one person do the job though? Or will you need an army of them? Yeah, no, I think one person will do the job really well but when you think of the larger issues around climate change, because climate change is the biggest issue we are facing and it and Bob's right it is uh, you've, got to, you've got to see it in context it's so much bigger issue than just South Dunedin or Dunedin um, but I am very heartened by what we have recently done and that is to put a million dollars over two years uh, to get action in place in our work program and um, that's only the start Um, We really have no idea at this point of the disruption that is ahead of us. But I have a belief that if we all are in the same waka and we're all travelling together, then we can address this. And we've got some very smart people around the table, some very smart staff. Um, I'd love to see some young people on council this time because those are the ones who have so much at stake. Mm. 5.28 5.28 and you are rattling the chains on ORFM. With me are three mayoral hopefuls, Bob Barlin, Christine Gary and Lee Vandervis. Can I just ask you this, Christine, um, Lee has said debt is a big deal still. Bob has said affordability is a big issue and you haven't mentioned money issues at all. Right, so what do you that. think about that? Let me talk about that. So we are required, expected as a council to have debt. That's a basic thing. And I find the... Um, Oh, the amounts we talk about are eye-watering to the general public. Absolutely. Kind of Hundreds very, of millions of absolutely. dollars. Absolutely. Hard to and imagine. And for somebody on a, a low or limited income, that is very difficult to hear. But what I find very helpful is when we think about it in terms of our assets. So here's the thing. If we were to sell all our assets, we would uh, pay off our debt and we'd have some millions of dollars over. That gives me confidence that we are on the right path. We also have our debt levels um, looked at uh, by the auditor's office and we have to show fiscal responsibility and I am very comfortable with all the processes that I have seen uh, and those checks and balances. So there's nothing there lurking there that you are worried about on the no. debt side? No. What about affordability? Are the rates going so, up? Can people afford their rates? So we consulted um, and engaged to a large extent through the long term plan and the annual plan and people have told us what the the investments are that they want for our city um, and so what we arrived at was a, a, a rates cap 
uh, of um, particular amount in last year and then this year, and an average of 5%, so the average over a period of time. We've kept to those uh, rate caps, and I'm very aware that for people on um, low incomes it's difficult. I pay rates. Mm. I don't like paying more. But we need to do that in order to invest in our city. So you can't have the investment in infrastructure without the sure. rates rises. You get what you pay but for, I, right. But I also say that it's really important people understand there is a rates rebate scheme. So for those who are really struggling mm. with that, that is available. Lee, what do you say about this stuff? We've got pretty much the same assets that... Councillor Gary, Gary would like to sell uh, in order to get rid of this debt. The same number of assets now that we did back in 2003, except for $200 million worth of stadium. But we've got $800 million worth of debt. What have we got for the $600 million worth of debt that we have recently acquired? And all I can see that we've got for it is a lot of extremely expensive, underused cycleways. This Council has been the most wasteful in the history of Dunedin. It has not only given us massive debt increases, the likes of which we've never seen, but they've not looked at what the council companies were doing. We've had no dividends for three years. We're not going to get any for the foreseeable future. Uh, and we're getting massive losses from the companies as well. All of this at a time when debt is going through the roof. You can argue it both ways, can't you? I mean, no, you at, one, can't. at one level, debt is the cheapest as it's ever been, right? I mean, interest yeah. rates are almost zero. Uh, interest rates so are... So it's not the crippling uh, in, burden that it could be. That's not true either. We are paying 4.65% interest because we are locked in. We are paying, on a billion odd dollars, we are paying $40 million in interest every year. This is hard-earned Dunedin money mm. which is being exported, and we're paying that high uh, rate because our financial people have locked us in to 4.65 percent. Yeah, but here's the thing, Lee. You've been saying this since you started, haven't you? I've it's been 12 right. years now. I've been right since we've started. You have been right at times, but the th well, but tell me when I haven't. <laughs> Seriously. But but you've been Was you've I been crying about the debt. I don't mean that in a bad way, but you've been you've been yelling about the debt yes. since you started, right? Yes. Yep. And in a way, for a while, it looked like it was coming down, and you, that now was, you'll say it's going up again. That was only looked like it was coming down because a lot of deferred maintenance There is a went place on. for debt, though, isn't there? There is no place for debt in the City Council. The idea of setting up the City Council companies, and this was before Councillor Gary's time, so she can be excused for not knowing this, the idea of setting up the Council companies was for them them to have the debt and for their earnings to cover the interest on that and to leave the DCC debt free. That was the motion that went through when the council companies were set up. We were supposed to be debt free and up until uh, about 2000 we were almost effectively debt free. Mm. But r since then I'm afraid successive short term thinking councils have simply spent money because they can, can, they've had debt ceilings which they've kept pushing up and then out of the blue because they haven't been looking, the council companies have started loading us up with unbelievable right. debt and deferred maintenance. What would you do if you were mayor? What would, what would you do that would be different? Well, for and is that a radical program, or is it a? Well, what do if, you have to do? If you call, if you call stopping the radical spending that this council's currently engaged in radical, then yes, it'll be radical. For a start, the sixty million dollars on the George Street upgrade defer. Actually, stop it altogether. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's you would stop that project that's now. That's sixty million to be saved. Twenty million for the um, uh, surface treatments around the university. Just stop it. Why do we do it? We don't need to do it. Uh, we need to defer the uh, bridge until we actually get some real uh, waterfront, waterfront bridge development. Mm -hmm. um, we simply need to stop. So you would want to put a hold on a lot of that spending that's planned at the put, moment? Put a hold on all of it because quite frankly, we are having to borrow to make that spending. And we've got out of control council companies who are borrowing much bigger than us even uh, to try and deal with deferred maintenance, and they're not doing it competently. Bob, is it time to do something radical like this? I mean, how concerned are you? Well, <clears throat> I'm very concerned, actually, because at the moment, the world's got very low interest rates uh, to repay loan. And, you know, when things are low for a long time, there's only one way they can go, and that's up. 
Now, at the moment, the current world position financially isn't looking too rosy, and it only needs a couple of wrong decisions to be made, and we're back into another recession again. And the council needs to have a backstop um, to protect uh, the city, frankly. Mm. The beautification Do you think it's risky? You think, eh? you think there's too many risks right now? I think there is at the moment, yes. I think we've got to take a deep breath and sit back a bit and do a proper 10-year, 30-year plan that actually says what we'd like to do and put a price on it, but it will only be done if this happens. For example, the waterfront. Beautification of the waterfront, I think that can be done fairly cheaply and I think it's a good project. The bridge, I think, uh, well, considering the majority of Dunedin people when they responded to that survey voted against the $20 million bridge. Um, I can't understand why we're going ahead with a $20 million bridge, especially a white one that goes over railway tracks where the trains belch out diesel fumes. I guess there's always been a dream though, hasn't there, of linking to the to the, to the harbour side. Yes, but you've already got two bridges. So what's wrong with linking those bridges and providing a walkway around the harbour? Um, what's wrong with developing the bridges that are already there? I mean, there's no covers over them, people using them. I mean, I don't understand why here, when you get a southerly wind and a rain coming in, all our bridges are up high and everybody's freezing and getting wet. You want a covered bridge? Them. Why don't they cover them? They cost even more bottom. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea. Great. Well, I've got to look out for my hair. It, um, <laughs> you know, it's just things like that. We need to sit back, take a breath and, and have a good look at it. And I mean, if climate change is going to occur and if sea level does come up, how long have we got the bridge for? Um, you know, because no one knows these things. Christine, is, it, is there a case for a pause? You don't think we're overextended? No, so let me talk to all of those points. Um, the waterfront development uh, is based on whether we get the um, provincial growth fund application. We don't know the news on that, but the bridge is absolutely vital as a trigger to the other development. But that's our be, 20 million, isn't it? It's not the central government's that's 20 million. Right, that's right. It's still big money, the isn't it? 20 million is ours. We consulted on that, and that's very important as the trigger to the private investment that would come in terms of the waterfront, the Stemmer Basin. Um, it's not going to be white, just uh, it's amazing the people who think that all the buildings are going to be white because the model's well, white. Well, the model's white. That's right, but it doesn't mean you, to say are they going to paint them? Um, so oh, they should tell it's us a, that. It's a particularly exciting visionary project and it has been thought out carefully. Sea level rise has been taken into account. Um, that's very much part of it and sustainability. So it's a very exciting project, as are the other projects that, go, that are going to lift our city uh, and the investment and going to be economic drivers for our city. And our big challenge is to manage the timing of them. Yeah, but that's, a, it's a, that, that's the ideological split, isn't it, this election, is, is whether, whether we're overextended and 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 or yeah or whether we need to be doing some of these development projects to keep the momentum up and the point is too that alongside that there's a planned infrastructure renewal going on as we speak and that has been planned out a number of years to address the issues that we have mm. Except that it's not going to address the flooding issue in South Dunedin because since the 2015 flood planned renewal spending on drainage in South Dunedin has been as low as it's ever been. It continues to be far lower than what was uh, told in the 2015 10-year uh, uh, plan. And there is no real money in renewing South Dunedin drainage planned till 2025. So we've got a terrible flood that cost unbelievable anguish and $175 million in property damage in 2015 and that has been followed by this council with gross underspending even on the basic maintenance of the drainage Would system. Would you want to shift the spending down there? Absolutely. I mean, we they want to spend $60 million essentially putting a cycleway up George Street, but they don't want to spend $20 million fixing the drainage in South Dunedin. It makes no sense at all. What else would you do in South Dunedin, Lee? What, what, South Dunedin's always talked about as the hotspot nationally for climate change. 
what would you what do you need to do if you if you ensured that there was proper drainage maintenance in South Dunedin that won't cut it though the seas the water's coming in people's gardens it's uh, not just the, the council no, drains no I think you'll find that as long as the drains are kept clear and the pumps work properly you're not going to have a problem if you think about uh, pumping systems and realise that, uh, I mean, Bob talked about the airport being a metre below sea level and what a worry that was. Mm. The biggest airport in Northern Europe is in Holland, it's called Schiphol, and it's five metres below yep. sea level, and they mm. just keep the pumps going and there's not a problem. But we so don't have the pumps, do we, yet? We do have pumps. We have a pumping station out at Portobello. But we don't have those the underground pumps like the Dutch. Yeah, no, no, and we, we don't have don't. dikes. No, they're actually made by the same manufacturers, the Swedish manufacturer of pumps. They're the same pumps. The problem with our pumps is we had a grill in front of them, which got absolutely chocker full mm. of rubbish so that the pumps couldn't work. We also have another great big pump out at Tahuna, uh, which we could have moved a whole uh, Moana pool's worth of water every five minutes if only mm. someone had switched it on. It wasn't and some of those things. It wasn't switched on because we didn't now, have regional mm, council yeah. permission. Mm. I mean, it's these these problems have been created. And all we need is a properly organised staff who actually do the job that they're supposed to be doing, and these problems will go away. South Dunedin is not a place we want to retreat from. South Dunedin is one of the best investment potential opportunities that we have. It's flat, it's large, it's got very good infrastructure except for drainage. All we have to do is sort the drainage. And we're going to have to sort St Kilda as well. Yeah. We're going to have to throw a bit of money at that, but not much far less than what they're talking about wasting on a cycleway up George Street. We're running out of time, but can I ask you about South Dunedin, both of you, Christine? Certainly. So what you, what's your vision for it? So I attended the HUI recently, and what I was really taken by was the collaborative approach and the community being on board. There was an address there, and I think the quote that comes to mind in response to my colleagues' comments is, you're entitled to your opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. So it's important to get the facts, uh, and we are spending money on the Green Line and Pump Station, a treatment plant and that's going to be pivotal in terms of dealing with uh, potential flooding in the future. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right, it's around the groundwater and uh, when it rains, adding to that and the equipment cannot cope, doesn't matter how much maintenance you What's do. What's the big vision Christine? Um, vision. Lee has said, you know, it can, it, it's flat and it's, so got, it's got a future and it can be Certainly. Do you see so too or do you think there's going to have to be some so accommodation for the water that's coming? We're still working on that and, and the facts around climate change and the statistics are still, we're still getting to grips with, we talk with the community about what's important to them and so that is a work in progress a work in progress by the ORC by the Dunedin City Council and might I remind my colleague that he's part of the council that he talks about as they mm. Bob, South Dunedin what's the vision? We need to form a mayoral task force that looks at the Dunedin region in total and the problems that are going to affect if we have a major disaster or in the event of climate change. South Dunedin is not just homes, it's also businesses, and in my view it's about 70% of Dunedin's small businesses, maybe 80%, are in South Dunedin, mm -hmm. including a strategic industry, which is a railway workshop, and that's a New Zealand strategic industry, that one. So we do have to look at it, and we need to have a regional, uh, a mayoral task force that looks using all the experts of around and involving the communities to come up with a plan that fits the whole thing. And it's not going to be done overnight. At the moment, we seem to be looking piecemeal at that, mm. that, this and One that. One thing at a time. But it's a big challenge coming, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's a very yeah. big challenge. Thank you all. Um, we're out of time, but um, I will, um, I do want to thank you very much for, for coming in and fronting up all of you. Um, we could probably talk for another hour. So, but thank you for being part of this um, and uh, may the best mayor win. Thank you, Ian. Hmm. Thank you, Ian. Uh, you can hear this program again or you can share it with your friends by going to our website. It's oar.org.nz and you can watch there. Uh, you can watch the pictures too. There are just three weeks to go until postal voting begins. So I hope that you're starting to work out who to vote for. Next Monday at five, we'll be talking to another three contenders. We have the Yes We Can councillor, Rachel Elder, Generation Zero activist Finn Campbell and a bookseller who's also a Donald Trump supporter, Malcolm Moncrief Spittle. So plenty to talk about there. Thanks to the awesome production team, Leslie, Jeff, Jeff and Domi. And thank you to you all for caring about local democracy. Catch you next week. Kia ora mai.